Yeah, so to begin, uh, the, uh, as Marissa mentioned, this is my second, th this book that we're going to talk about today is my second book. I, I have another one in the hopper, so um, uh, that one was Native Decatur, and this book sort of takes a similar uh, approach that I, I like to look at local history and, and think about um, why a place is where it is and when it really started. Uh, I think with Decatur, we have a tendency to always go back to the day it was founded. And with Atlanta, the, the local lore and the history that people know of, of Atlanta is that it was uh, founded by the railroads. And that's true, but it's sort of, there's a lot more to it. It's, it's much more complicated than that. So the mistake, I, I picked a topic to talk about today. Um, let me share my first slide with all of you. I brought slides. So the mistake I, I usually make when I'm doing a book talk is to, to try and recite the book to everybody. And this book actually covers a lot of ground. It covers, it covers an enormous amount of ground. If you think about it, it, it begins with uh, prehistoric times and just uh, laying out the reasons that the, the space where Atlanta is located is shaped the way it is. Um, and, um, you know, how literally Pangea and the formation of the Appalachian Mountains uh, form the way that the land uh, sits around Atlanta, which, which is done for a very good reason, because those are actually the reasons Atlanta is where it is, if you really trace it back. Um, the way that the land lies around here is the reason we have a city on this spot, if you really think about it. So if, anybody, if everybody can see my screen, um, and I was going to say, and then it go, takes it all the way through up to the founding of the city and the railroads coming in and sort of the frontier days of Atlanta and finishes in 1850 when there was a, a violent uprising in the city that sort of I view as the city's coming of age. It, it was sort of a, a rough and tumble um, not a cowboy town, but similar to cowboy towns that you you would um, see out west. It was a frontier town, literally. It was on the American frontier at this point. Um, and it was lawless. Um, but then there was a conflict between the sort of law-supporting side of the city and the side of the city that wanted to keep it as rough as it was. And there was a lot of violence that happened in 1850. And the next day after the smoke cleared, I feel like that was the day that we had a city instead of a, uh, instead of a frontier village. But I'm not gonna cover all that today. Um, I, I wanna go through with everybody uh, how very quickly, how, the, how did Atlanta come to be and why is it where it is? And hopefully I'll finish that. I'll keep an eye on the time. I wanna finish that around 1230 and allow a lot of time for questions because that's the more fun part I think for everyone here uh, and I'm prepared to talk about several topics a lot of the ones I get asked about the most I listed for you here if anybody wants to ask about them I, I the, there's a, a neat story about why Atlanta is named Atlanta um, that I love to tell people uh, crime and punishment in early Atlanta is, is always fun to talk about because um, I spent a lot of time researching a lot of the uh, a lot of the crime that happened in Atlanta, as much as the the sort of um, more settled and and law abiding side of the city, which is always fun to talk about. Uh, is there anything that you, you had to take out of the book that you wish you had left in? People often ask me, "What's the most surprising thing you found in your research?" And uh, the black experience in antebellum Atlanta, I I did my best to to try and understand that and document as much as I could. I think there's a pretty good chapter about that in the book. Um, and I'm happy to talk about it if we have time. But let's talk about why, why Atlanta came to be. Uh, there. So this is why Atlanta came to be. This is a map of the United States as it existed in 1825. And you can see um, this, the, the country was growing to the left, it was growing out west and it was not quite, not even half as big as it is now. Um, everyone had plans to settle 
all of North America and all, all the places you see here, I think all the president and the rest of America had fully plans to make all of this the United States, but it wasn't yet. Um, but there were new parts of the country, uh, especially those around, if you, I don't know, can you see the arrow that I've got there? I think you probably can. All of these spaces right here had just been added to the union. Um, Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, Kentucky, these were all new states. And it changed, it changed the country. It changed the whole way that, that um, the country functioned. Whereas before, up until now, this was the United States over here. And in particular, you had Charleston and Savannah look for us, uh, us Southerners and us people who now live in Atlanta and Georgia. Those were the important ports of the country. Uh, and that's where most of the commerce of the country was traveling out and it, with the addition of New York. But things changed when the country expanded to the West and there weren't, there weren't a lot of roads out there and there were certainly no railroads at this time. What they had was the Mississippi River, the big black line that's, that's right here. So at that point, Atlanta was founded because of New Orleans. Atlanta, um, was a response to the fact that most of the goods, uh, most of the, the cargo in the whole country had been going out of Savannah and Charleston, and it wasn't anymore. It was going out of New Orleans. At this point, around 1825, New Orleans burst, I, I, it grew with, with amazing rapidity. And it, it, all of a sudden, it became the third largest city in the country and the second largest port in the United States. That was out of nowhere. So Atlanta, uh, I'm sorry, not Atlanta, Savannah and Charleston suffered. All of the commerce and all of the money that had been traveling through Savannah and Charleston disappeared. So the South had to do something about it. And this was a technological age, believe it or not, um, with the invention of railroads. Uh, the 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 the, a plan was formulated by a coalition of the southern states that they wanted to build a network of railroads, the new technology that was mostly being used in Europe at this point in Eng England, uh, in order to bring all of the com commerce back to the south and revive Charleston and Savannah. So they wanted to build networks that would get to here up further up the Mississippi River and bring all those goods over to the East Coast where they could travel faster and, and, and you know, sway some of that commerce away from New Orleans. So just flip to the next slide. But so this focusing now on Georgia, it took until 1833, and there's a lot more that I'll skip over, but there was sort of a race was on between South Carolina and Georgia in order for who could be the, who could build the hub of, of this vast Southern railroad network they wanted to create. So in 1833, uh, Georgia finally woke up and started establishing their railroads. And you can see December 20th, 1833 was the first railroad that was established in Georgia. It was the Georgia railroad, uh, aptly named, um, that was gonna bring, that was, going to connect Augusta and Athens. And then on December, actually it was December 21st, there's a typo here. Um, December 21st, 1833, the Central Railroad was established that was gonna connect Savannah with Macon. And on December 23rd, 1833, the Macon and the Monroe Railroad was established and which was later called the Macon and Western. But that's as far as they got that. And there were as there was a lot of blank space over there to the left. So what they had to do, they had to connect these roads to Chattanooga and from Chattanooga, they could get to the Mississippi River. So you had all this blank space here where everyone was saying, how are we going? We've got these two railroads traveling west in the direction so we can start connecting um, the Mississippi River down here to the south, to places like Savannah and Augusta. But what are we gonna do? Well, the, there were no major towns, unlike Savannah and Augusta and Macon, 
there were not major towns or companies that were gonna fund a railroad. The state had to step in. So the big endeavor of the state on December 21st, 1836, was to establish a state-funded uh, railroad. Uh, and the reason it was in 1836 was because people may realize a lot of this land that we're traveling across right here didn't even belong to Georgia up until 1835. The Cherokee, the last piece of land in Georgia was not ceded over to the state of Georgia by the Cherokees until 1835. So immediately the state began establishing a railroad to travel through that region. But this, and this gets into what we, I, I briefly mentioned at the beginning of the, the discussion, the fact that this was blank, that this, even Americans at the time viewed this as blank space and it, it was the wilderness, it was Cherokee country, but it was by no means was it uh, empty or, or unsettled. The next slide shows this, even before those railroads happened or, or, or were established, this is the, uh, the network of trails really that were, that were already there crisscrossing Georgia for a long, for thousands of years before these railroads were established. And if you look at these connections right around here, that's, that's where we're all sitting and where the DeKalb History Center is, is right on that point right there. That's um, the connection of the Sandtown Road and the um, a, a road that travels down to Indian Springs. So there were, as, as it turned out, when the railroad engineers started looking at all of these, these networks that were already existing across the state, they couldn't make any improvements on them. The, they, they were already perfect. So it was, immediately thought that we need, if we're gonna establish um, a railroad that needs to come down here through New Echota and down here and connect with these other roads that were already traveling along these lines from Augusta and Savannah, then there, were, there was a, a good hint of where those things should travel. And I took a map that was, um, that, that, that's in the book that I published I, I turned it sideways because I think it's easier for us to talk about it since I'm pointing north is to the top, but it just fit better in the book if I turned it sideways, but that's Atlanta. That's Atlanta before there were any railroads or roads or anything. This, we are founded on top of several major trails that were there for thousands of years. And now these trails, these trails still exist. We just call them by different names. We call them Peachtree Street and Whitehall Street and Five Points and um, Marietta Street. Um, and these were the places that, that um, it was, that it made a lot of sense to connect the railroad. Um, so when you had, so when you needed to cover all that space, this is what was eventually established. Um, these, the, the red lines that I outlined there are the additional pieces of the railroad um, that were connected to the two that were already established. So we've got three railroads coming in to a hub. Uh, you got the Western Atlantic, the Georgia, and the Macon and Western or the Monroe. And I, I marked a place in the book that I wanna read. The, on uh, December, on December 10th, um, yeah, December 10th, 1836, there was, was a resolve put in the Georgia legislature that said um, that they planned to build a railroad from some point on the Tennessee line near the Tennessee River commencing at or near Rossville, which is Chattanooga, in the most direct practic practicable route to quote, some point on the Southeastern bank of the Chattahoochee River. And I, I always loved reading that because that is literally the first sentence that was ever written that pointed toward there being a city in this spot out there. And as you can see, I, I put the Chattahoochee River in on this map and they located a point just south of that. And as the city grew up and was established further, that this is, I, I believe this map was original, it's a copy of a map that I think was originally formed in. 1850, 
but this is still our downtown area in Five Points. And you can see here where the railroad came in from the Western Atlantic, where the Macon and Western came in, and where the Georgia Railroad came in and all met at this point here in land lot 77, which became the center of Atlanta. So that's, that's why Atlanta is where it is. And there were lots of stops and starts, lots of left turns and right turns and hills along the way that are all documented in the book. There's, there are literally hundreds of interesting stories that surrounded how it came to be at this point. It, it wasn't originally supposed to be there. It was supposed to be in a different spot, which is why we have the Monroe Embankment over here that became useless and is a great story that um, some of you probably know about how John Thrasher, who I would say is was the first Atlantan, not the first person to arrive in the area, but the first person to arrive there because of all this happening. Uh, John Thrasher built this Monroe Embankment and tried to establish the first town around it. Um, but because the, the terminus, the, the place where all the railroads were going to meet was moved, um, that whole endeavor became uh, useless. But that Monroe Embankment is still there. It's under the Georgia World Congress Center, and you can go down and look at it if you want to. Um, and then a, a, just I'll briefly talk about this slide, and then I'll start asking for any questions. Um, it's only 12, 18, but that's fine. Um, eventually this network continued and you can see where, how Atlanta became important as a point in the network, um, connecting up to Chattanooga and then eventually up to Cairo, high up on the Mississippi River where they could catch all that cargo and send it down to Savannah and Charleston um, without letting it slowly travel all the way down to New Orleans on Mark Twain's uh, riverboats which was a better way to do it because it, it could travel much faster that way and get to warehouses. Um, things grew up so quickly in New Orleans that they didn't even have a warehouse. So they would just put everything on the dock. So if you were gonna, if you were gonna put beef or, or um, any kind of perishable goods like corn or anything, uh, you can imagine sitting on a dock by the river and or by, by the Gulf in New Orleans was not a great way to preserve your cargo. So uh, it worked and the Southern network was established and here we now have Atlanta. Um, and so with that, I'll ask for uh, any questions people would like to talk about. Brief. Yeah, we have a, a question that asks about what can you tell us about the laborers who built the railroads? That, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so flipping to the first couple of pages in the book, I don't have a slide for that one. So I'll take myself off video. I do have some more slides that may help us on the way, but. Oh, start video. Stop sharing. That's a great question. Um, the dedication of the book reads to the people who built the Georgia railroads with their hands and did more than anyone else to create the great new city in the South, but received very little of the reward or the recognition for having done it. So there were three main groups of people who built those railroads. And I say, I, I specifically choose my words in that dedication uh, by saying the people who built the Georgia railroads with their hands. Um, the, the, the legislature and the people who funded the railroads, if, you, if anyone says who built the railroad, um, the, the most common answer would be the state because the state established funds in order to build the railroad. But it, it, if you answer that question literally, no, that none of those legislators ever picked up an act, a pick or hammered in a, a, a spike in order to build the railroads. Uh, it was a lot of other people who suffered a lot because of it and who lived um, difficult lives um, who actually deserve most of the credit for having literally founded Atlanta, literally put Atlanta where it is. So that began with the Irish um, or it began with Europeans, I should say. 
um, of which uh, the largest proportion of them, but certainly not all of them were Irish. Uh, the, the, the Irish famine was just hitting uh, and just beginning to really take hold in Ireland at the point that we wanted to build railroads in Georgia. Um, and so there was a huge influx of immigrants coming over to the United States in order to seek out a new way of life. And that worked great at first. Um, John Thrasher, who built the Monroe Embankment, which was, pro which was, I think, the first, well, definitely was the first railroad project ever established in the Atlanta area. It was in 1839, I think. Um, his original crew was all Irish people. And there's some really delightful stories in the book about this, this community that they formed of Irish immigrants um, that was literally in where downtown Atlanta is now. And a, a really funny story about how he hired a foreman from Ireland um, uh, who was an experienced man who we thought would be a great foreman for building the Monroe Embankment. But this foreman's uh, wife declared that she would not, she would not, she was not interested in living in the wilderness. And his foreman refused to come if his wife was not going to move to John Thrasher's little town that he was building there. So they came to an agreement that uh, this man, the foreman's wife would be willing to relocate herself to these little houses that Thrasher had built in the woods if there was a wooden floor. And it, she, she deemed that to be the mark of society. Uh, she refused to live on a dirt floor and she needed a wooden floor. So uh, Thrasher went out and got a bunch of boards and laid down a wooden floor and the man agreed to relocate and he joined Thrasher as his foreman. Um, and, and the rest, as the, you know, the rest is history. They, they, there's a great story about how they had their first party in Atlanta on this wooden floor where they all celebrated that and danced and tromped all over it. And the very next day, everybody in the, in the little town uh, wanted wooden floors. So he had to put boards in in every shack that they had there. So it was, it, it was delightful at first. Um, th these people had, had escaped a starving community in Ireland and having these little shacks in the woods where they had money and seemed to have actually had a lot of um, happiness together there. Uh, so it, that was great. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the rest of the story as it plays out is a little bit of an allegory with Thrasher it is, is very symbolic of the rest of the story that one day his Irish team of people that were doing all this work for him came to him and said they refused to work anymore until they got higher wages. And it's another first for the community. This was the first labor strike that ever occurred in Atlanta. So John, as he describes it, sat down on, on the steps of his little store there and smoked his pipe and tried to decide what to do about it. And according to him, just at that moment, a preacher came up to him and asked him and said that he had about 20 slaves that he would like to, that he was looking for a place to employ them. Um, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but um, the, the rate at which John Thrasher could hire these slaves was even far less than the rate at which he was paying his Irish workers from the beginning. And, far, and certainly far less than the wages they were demanding with their labor strike. So he, he, Thrasher continued to employ his Irish laborers, but he, he brought in a large number of uh, African-American slaves in order to do the work too. And that was a, a scenario that was playing out all across the country. And as transition, as things progressed, uh, most of the people that built the Georgia railroads were, um, were in fact slaves. That, that was a bit of a controversial thing uh, because the, the Georgia Railroad Company still exists. I, I think it's, it's part of a larger company now, but honey, we'll talk long. Um, the, uh, there was, I don't know if you'd call it a cover up, but the, the, the railroad companies refused to admit that they in fact owned slaves and that they employed their slaves in order to build the railroads. 
eventually they had to admit that and they um, uh, issued apologies for having for having done that. But it was clear that the um, that there was evidence. They they there was actually an investigation and they found on the books of the railroad companies from that time among their assets they listed people um so obviously you can't deny that the company itself did actually own slaves not just hired them out from other people um so those are the those are the people that built the railroads and the third group that also did some of the work on these were the unfortunate native americans who were departing the south at the time but um there was one report of a governor who was traveling on the train and passed by uh, a group that he saw working on the railroads that were all Cherokees. So there, I, there's not a lot of um, not a lot of information about how many there were, but certainly there were a lot of uh, Native Americans who were able to earn their wages by building the railroads as well. And if you go to Oakland Cemetery, last last thing I'll say about that, I've had a, a fun time going to Oakland Cemetery and trying to find some of these graves of some of these Irish laborers and some of, of the African-American people who were in Atlanta during the time and were the people who actually built these, um, built the railroad that we have downtown. And there is a section of Oakland Cemetery where you, where you will find a lot of at least the Irish laborers are there. I've identified several of those graves and they all seem to be clustered together in, in a community fashion. Uh, and by the dates on the graves, you can tell these, these were people who would have been about you know, 20, 25 years old at the time. And they were, they were our Atlanta, first Atlanta residents. Okay, um, could you share more about the Sandtown Trail? Sure. Um, Sandtown itself is a is a fascinating place. Um, obviously, the Sandtown Trail was a. Um, let me think here. The, uh, well, let me talk about Sandtown first, and then I'll talk about the Sandtown Trail. It was the the Native Americans who lived in this area were the Cowitas, and the Cowitas were Creeks, but. Creek is a general term that we use to refer to a large group of people who all spoke the same language. The, the Creeks themselves view, viewed themselves as being friends and part of a larger community. But within that culture, they did not view themselves as all the same. Um, the, the basis, the, the real basis by which Creek Native Americans truly identify themselves was according to which town they pledged their allegiance to. And the, these towns were, were connected into sort of um, hierarchies of power. And the Coweta lived along the Chattahoochee River. The town of Coweta was not actually located um, in or near Atlanta, but the Indians that were living in the Atlanta area were part pledged their allegiance to Coweta, the town that was further down. And there were two villages that were, two relatively large villages that were here in the Atlanta, Decatur area were Sandtown and Standing Peachtree. And Sandtown was the older and more important of these two towns. Standing Peachtree often gets most of the attention. Um, because we have Peachtree Avenue and everybody says who, you know, every, a lot of people like to point out that a reason we have Peachtree and everything's called Peachtree in Atlanta is because of Standing Peachtree, which was a Creek village that was located near Atlanta. But Sandtown, if you go back further than that and you look into um, the actual, you know, the politics among the Creek nation itself as the treaties were being formed with the Georgians, you'll see Sandtown pop up more often. And there have been some archeological digs around the Sandtown area um, that identify the fact, or have identified artifacts that are much older than the ones that they find in Standing Peachtree. So this was one of the, it was actually an ancient 
village that predates the creeks themselves. Um, the the there's there's no real uh, in in archaeological research we call these the woodland Indians, um, but there's no real name for these people. They were they 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 were the mound builders, um, but since they didn't have a written language, we don't we don't know what they called themselves. And even the Creeks and the Cherokees didn't know what these older people called themselves. So that's that's how old Sandtown is. I I think it dates back. Um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, I, I could be wrong. I'm trying to do this from memory, but I think the artifacts that they found there date back about 4,000 years. Um, so that the, the sand town trail was obviously the, the, the trail in order to get to sand town. And if I, I'm going to rely on one of my maps here in order to, to point out where that is. Um, rather than do it from memory. So here's downtown and Whitehall Street is the Sandtown Trail, it, which travels right through Decatur as well. Um, if you follow the, if, if you see this where it says Slabtown and Decatur Street, and you go up here, obviously the, the you, are going to get right to the the courthouse, or where um, I think Marissa and Melissa and some others might be sitting right now. And it looks like they're at home. But um, the the DeKalb Courthouse and the DeKalb History Center, like downtown Atlanta, are located right on the crossroads of of several Indian trails. And one of those, one of the more important of those, is the Sandtown Trail that comes right down here and travels down Decatur Street. And then takes sort of a left turn and goes down here toward Whitehall Street. So that's the Sandtown Trail. And I think there are some other books in the Native Decatur book and in this book. I go into a lot of detail. I think mean, Carl Hudgens was was another historian, and I use a lot of his research to point out exactly where those trails travel through the Atlanta area. So when you um, it's another aside, but it, it's interesting. Um, there were a lot of complaints back in the day. I don't really hear it more. You can see that the downtown streets as they were laid out when Atlanta was founded, if they run crooked, they run diagonal toward the Northeast and Southeast and then, um, and then the opposite direction instead of running North, South and East, West. So every time you, tr you drive one of these smaller roads downtown, and then you have to take sort of a, a right turn jog. Um, you can think about these. The reason you're doing that is because thousands of years ago, people used to walk through this area and they decided the best way to travel through, through that, the piece of land where we all sit now was to travel on sort of on this diagonal route. And there was a, there was a lot of controversy at the time that uh, Jonathan Norcross, one of the, you know, probably the most influential person of the antebellum period, who was mayor of Atlanta, um, wrote several times that that the way they we laid out this city was was completely idiotic, and and houses are just all over the place, and none of the and he would always say none of the roads are straight. Well, that's why this is why none of the roads are straight. Um, in fact, I make a point in the book that. that he, he was always saying they should be straight, like they should run north, south, and east, west, like, like a, a quote unquote normal city. That's actually where the mistake is. These roads are, are laid out that run diagonally are laid out much better than the north, south roads. And you can see everything, whoever owned a landlot was allowed to lay out the roads on it. So each of these landlots was owned by a different person. And the downtown area, which was owned by a man named Mitchell, was laid out diagonally in consistent with the trails that were running through town. These other land lots that were settled later on then go north, south, east, west. And um, that's purely because whoever owned that land decided that was the proper way to do it. But in, in I think in, in more modern um, thinking about how to lay out a city, this diagonal route was, was a, 
was actually kind of pretty innovative for the time that they did it. And that's how it should have been done. Okay, um, we have one that asks about when and why determinists get changed to Atlanta? That's a great question. And there's a lot of, so Atlanta has a lot of names and it's fun to learn all of the names. Uh, I think most people know that Atlanta was called Marthasville. Um, and first it was called Terminus. So Terminus was, was a nickname. Um, the reason everybody was coming here and the reason all those Irish people arrived and John Thrasher started building that embankment and then other people at the same time he was doing that, a lot of other people started showing up. Um, the reason they were showing up is because they heard there were going to be railroads traveling through here. And there was the, the speculation was wild all over the country about railroads. And you, uh, we've all seen the the old western where the uh, the the crooked businessman uh, influences the railroad company so that he can point the railroad toward the piece of land that he owns and and make a lot of money and that was all very true back then uh, across the whole country everybody was buying up land because they thought the railroad was going to arrive there and they were going to have the one spot where the railroad up and they put a general store and a saloon and a hotel there and they would become rich and it worked for some people most people it didn't and there was actually a huge um, real estate bubble that happened at the time that uh, the value of land and the, and the loans people were taking out were, were way out of whack with with the actual value of the land so I say all that to say that's that was terminus um, everybody that showed up and wanted to settle there in expectation that there was going to be something there eventually because we were going to have this crossroads where there were going to be railroads. Just, it was originally, you know, if you pass someone on the, on the trail and they're riding a horse and they say, where are you headed? They said, we're headed toward the terminus. You know, have you heard there's going to be a terminus in, in the woods here? Uh, and then it just became sort of shortened of they started calling it terminus. And that is true that that it that was that was the name of the place where the people settled. They called it terminus. Um, and th there's a there's a, another fun story around John Thrasher. Uh, if anybody's seen the historical marker downtown that that marks out where Thrasherville was, um, I'm, I'm proud to say, as a historian, I'm proud to say that it's completely wrong. Nobody ever called it Thrasherville. Thrasherville didn't exist. John Thrasher himself never used, as far as I've been able to, to research and find out, uh, and anybody who's welcome to correct me on it, but I haven't found it yet, John Thrasher never used the word Thrasherville. He did have a name for his town, which was maybe worse, maybe better, I don't know. He and, and uh, I forget his first name, but he, he had a partner named Dean and they opened a store together in this little community where they had their Irish laborers and everything. And he was the first, he, he opened the first uh, uh, store that ever existed in the area and, and they bought up land and they planned to have a town there and they were gonna call it Dean Town. And that's, that's, that is another official name, I think, of of what became Atlanta was called Dean Town. Um, and then there's, there's a wonderful story about Marthasville. Um, and I, I won't tell the whole story right now. I'll, I'll leave room for other questions. It's all in there, but Marthasville was uh, Wilson Lumpkin who became the dispersing agent for the Western Atlantic Railroad, the state railroad, who was a former governor of Georgia um had a daughter named Martha and he didn't come up with the name Marthasville but his friends did who were the people who owned the land and there is a there is a there's been a lot of suspicion about shenanigans going on in how um Wilson Lumpkin and I think his name's George Mitchell and his chief engineer of the Western Atlantic Railroad named Garnet they moved the terminus uh, John Thrasher and everybody else thought the terminus was going to be in one spot. Wilson Lumpkin came along, met his friend Mitchell, and they moved the terminus. And 
by coincidence or not, they moved it from land that Mitchell didn't own over into land that Mitchell did own. Highly suspect. Um, and then uh, clearly Mitchell and Garnet uh, were very grateful to their friends, the former governor for moving the land, the terminus over into Mitchell's land and to honor him named the town Marthasville for his daughter. And there's a, there's a lot of, it's uh, something I can't conclude, but it was uh, one, of those, one of those stories of, it, it clearly has the motives and the, and the suspicions of, uh, of some shenanigans there. But as far as anybody can tell, Wilson Lumpkin never financially profited from that move. So who knows? We have one about um, kind of a Decatur lore. Um, yes. One of the railroad- I, I can guess what that is. Yeah. What is it? What's the <laughs> one question? Of the railroad companies originally asked to put the end of the line, said no. And so it was moved west to where Atlanta now sits. Yeah. And I'm ha always happy to talk to my fe fellow Decaturites. Uh, it's false. That is absolutely not true. Um, nobody wanted to put the terminus in Decatur. They wanted the railroad to travel through Decatur, um, but um, Henry Long, who was the chief engineer who laid out the Western and Atlantic and decided where he was gonna put it, had three, had, um, had like four choices of where, he, where they might put the terminus and, the, and it's all in their letters and documented with the other engineers, they were out surveying the land and seeing how it flowed down um, on the other side of the Chattahoochee and, and trying to lay out a route where they could get up to Chattanooga. And they narrowed it down to two places uh, and eventually planted a stake very close to, um, not exactly in the same spot, but very close to where the railroads come together today. Um, and they never, they never considered putting it in Decatur. The, um, it, it, it is true though that Decatur didn't want it. Um, and Decatur never liked Atlanta. And there was always this, uh, Decatur was very um, genteel. De Decatur was the county seat and it was where, all, where the court was and all the lawyers lived there and they were a little wealthier. They didn't wanna have anything to do with those railroad people. Um, and in fact, there was a proposal once that, <laughs> believe it or not, it's true, they, they actually wanted to build a wall uh, between Atlanta and Decatur where uh, the, the ruffians from Atlanta would not be able to easily travel up to Decatur and bring all of their mischief and, and nuisances up there. Uh, there there's a, there's a, it, it was, Atlanta and Decatur had a fascinating relationship. Looks like we have one um, the about topography and Native American trails, yes. and if a lot of the trails followed the the natural high points or topography. They did, and uh, um, they were amazingly good at it. Amazingly good, um, considering they didn't have any surveying instruments or anything in order to lay out their trails. Um, when the people with the instruments and all the education, these, these engineers came along later to lay out the railroads and the roads, they tried to change the roots of the trails that were already there. They, because partly out of, out of uh, a little bit of arrogance, they wanted to say that they found a better way to do it, but they couldn't do it. They, they could not find better routes than what the Native Americans had already laid out. And it's, it's, it's fascinating and you wonder, they must have known, but um, anybody who lives around Decatur or, or uh, knows that the, the Eastern Continental Divide actually travels right through downtown of our, of our town, our city. And on one side of that line, if you take a pitcher of water and you pour it on one side of that line, it'll go down to the Gulf of Mexico. If you pour it on the other side of that line, it'll go all, it'll trickle all the way down to the Atlantic Ocean. And literally that line comes right through town. And literally the major trails that came through the area 
traveled right along that line with amazing accuracy without just just by instinct just by knowing that this was the best way for us to walk so um again that's that's the reason that everything we've got now is still sitting on those points and the reason we can actually trace all those native trails along downtown around five points and the sand town trail and the peach tree trail and all of that can the reason it's so easy for us to point out where those ancient trails are is because that's the, our roads sit right smack on top of them and the reason they sit right smack on top of them is because there was no reason to change them it's you, you don't broke what doesn't need fix don't break what doesn't need fixing so yeah it's it's a fascinating topic it's it's one of the ones that that got me going on this sort of research and understanding these things additionally too the railroads of course also were built on those same yep. trails they it's easier convenient not trying to build bridges and waterways exactly. so building it on the high high points yeah yeah it, it depending on whether it's a railroad or a road basically whoever was there first took over the trail um so a, a lot of the railroads and a lot of even our highways um Highway 20 travels over an, an ancient Indian trail that just got expanded over the years. Um, you can um, see it uh, if you sit, if you go over to the courthouse indicator and stand in, especially in the winter when the leaves aren't on the trees and look around, that's why you can, you get such a nice view from there and you can see the tips of the buildings downtown in Atlanta because that was the highest point in the region. From whom did Thrasher build the Monroe Embankment? Um, who hired him to do it? I guess that is, is that the question. Yeah, that's the question, yeah. Uh, he he. There was a bid for contract. Uh, I can't remember the the amount that he got. It's in the book, but he he was a he was a very young man, very ambitious. He's he's a fascinating character, really interesting guy. Uh, shows up a lot all over this history and was very gregarious and chatty. So um, he left behind a lot of a lot of good stories about what it was like back then. Um, so I, he grew up in Covington, I think, and came over and um, was a young man, I, I, you know, 18, 19, something like that, very young and wanted to leave home and, and go make his fortune. And so when the Monroe Railroad sent out bids for contracts for someone that they needed to build an embankment. An embankment, I think we all know what an embankment is. It's a, it's a hill, basically. Uh, the way they laid out the railroads originally, it, it, there was a point where they wanted to put the terminus where it went down into a valley and um, they needed to raise it up so that it could get to the terminus where they originally thought it was. Um, it ended up not being theirs and that was the fiasco that we talked about earlier. Um, so the, rail, it, it, the, the Monroe Railroad was a commercial company. It was a for-profit uh, company and they were bidding out contracts for an engineer to go build that for them and Monroe um, I mean, uh, Thrasher won the contract probably because he was the cheapest bidder. And, but he, he succeeded at it and he built it for them. Um, and he did well with it. And I'll show you, go back to my slides here. Uh, one of my favorite things that I was able to figure out. There it is. That, I took that picture about six months ago. That's that's uh, inside. It's under the parking lot for the Georgia World Congress Center. All of that dirt there on the right has been was piled up back in 1839 by John Thrasher, and that's the Monroe Embankment. It's still there. Um, and eventually, they did put a railroad across it, across it, but not at that time. Not not at the time that John Thrasher thought they would.
Um, do we have any other questions from anyone? While we're waiting for any more, was there anything surprising that you learned um, in doing, in writing this book or maybe any other myths that you busted? Uh, I think there, there probably were some more myths that I busted. Um, I always, that, that is obviously something you go out and try and figure out. Um, I, I, I enjoyed busting that myth about Thrasher Bill um, because of the, because it's, it's, widely known um the 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 most interesting or fun parts of it <laughs> were were when the town was founded uh, it was really fascinating and fun to read about the frontier days of atlanta um i took some stats uh, as you can imagine well well generally what happened was that all these Irish laborers who came to town, and, and I, I keep saying Irish, but there were a lot of them who um, were, were German, a lot of them were English, um, pretty much every country in, um, in, in Europe, um, in Western Europe, filled the, so the, filled the area. And uh, of the, the Irish people were definitely the most prominent. Maybe they were the loudest. I'm Irish, so I can say that. Um, may, they got the most attention, but um, they probably made up about 30 or 40% of the people that were in Atlanta. And if anybody's been to Savannah, obviously there, there's a huge Irish um, base to that city as well. And that's because of this era. Um, so, you know, it, things were not as organized back then as they are now. Uh, as soon as these railroads were finished around the mid 1830s or late 1830s, um, there was no severance pay. It, it was done. So all these Irish workers and other European workers just got thrown out of work. And they didn't even have the means to go anywhere with their money. Um, if, if they were able to, they would have headed further west and built more railroads, which they did, a lot of them. Um, or they would have become farmers, which a lot of them did. Uh, a, a lot of people, there, there's a lot of petitions in the Decatur Courthouse and the records that, that we have at the History Center about Irish people um, at, um, putting in requests for citizenship citizenship in the United States. And you can trace these people back to farms that cropped up in the area. So a lot of these Irish people started farms. A lot of them didn't know how to farm though. So they ended up being just um, out of work people looking to scratch their way through as best they could. And most of them were not very educated and most of them were 20 years old or so. So at, you can imagine you put all those people together. They love to drink. They love to gamble. And there were eventually there were railroads coming in, big, bringing people to town. Atlanta became quite a place at that point. And a large part of the town, sadly, a large part of the, of the way that these people and their wives and girlfriends were able to survive was prostitution. Um, the, uh, Atlanta became a huge, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but there were, there were a lot of prostitutes in Atlanta. And in fact, uh, eventually, they, um, arre eventually they arrested as many prostitutes as they could. They didn't have a jail, so there was no place to put them. So they arrested them, kept them, kept them a day and then let them go. And they were back um, plying their trade two days later, literally. Um, and at one point, I wrote it down, at this point in Atlanta, which would, would be about 1847 when it was at its peak, there was one bar in Atlanta for each 50 adults. And there was one prostitute in Atlanta for each 12 men who lived in the city. So it was big business at that point. Um, and that's what eventually led to what happened in 1851 when there was a violent conflict. The, there was a large part of the town who was wanting to become a city 
and Jonathan Norcross, the mayor, was at the forefront of this. And uh, a bunch, to cut the story short and tell you what happened, a mob of people put on white hoods. This was called white capping at the time. It was, it was connected to what would eventually happen with the Ku Klux Klan. This was the origins of what happened with hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan, but this predates that. So there, were, there was a vigilante mob, went and put hoods on with eye holes in them, just like imagine Ku Klux Klan people, but, and got a bunch of torches and axes and went over into Stink Nation, which was the, where all the prostitutes lived, pulled everyone out of their house, threw them on the road, and then burned the whole community down. That's the climax of the book that I wrote. And that's what I was referring to earlier that um, when the smoke cleared the next day, I felt like they now live in a city instead of a wild town. Um, it was violent though. And, and it was, it was, uh, it was shameful. It was shameful. I, I you know, it, 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 it I don't know what else to say about it. it. It was fascinating to read about, but it's not, unlike a lot of other stories that I read in there, it didn't make, certainly didn't make me feel good. Um, and uh, apart from that, there were a lot of, uh, I, I referenced the jail and the stories about the jail are just hilarious. That uh, leading up to this, there were a lot of funny things that eventually what happened was, was pretty shameful. But leading up to this, they, the city would try to arrest the people who were acting up. There were a lot of fights and, and there, there was literally a conflict between the old world and the new world where uh, th their political party was literally called the rough and ready party. Uh, they didn't have Democrats or Whigs or Republicans. The, the opposing, the, the, it was the... Um, was called the rough and ready party and, and it was made up a lot of these people who wanted to keep the town wide open which they had very good reasons for they want the the best ways that they had for making money were gambling and selling whiskey so they didn't want any laws coming in telling them they can't do that or putting taxes on those things so it's understandable within their circumstances but as as the uh as these people were trying to rise up and and get rid of jonathan norcross and his his reforms that he wanted to make to the city, they started arresting people and they put them in their calaboots, which is a jail. And they could literally lift it off the ground. It was a box made of logs and it was set on the ground and it had a dirt floor. So anybody you put in the calaboose could either dig a hole and get out from under it or call some of their friends and they would put people, they would just station people around it and they would lift it off the ground and then you get out of jail. And there was a great story that I read that it just made me laugh out loud that after people who had done that a few times, they went, uh, there was somebody else who was arrested and it was another case where somebody got out of it, but they had taken a huge rock and put it on top of the jail. <laughs> Instead of building a floor or anything, they, they put a big rock on top of it. So hopefully those people wouldn't be able to lift the jail and get out. So you can see, you know, Applying law and order in early Atlanta was was easy and quite comical, and it, 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 applying it, getting the town going was really fascinating. That that uh, they the, the first I think five years where they tried to um, impose city taxes, just nobody paid. Uh, they 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 had two thousand citizens, and they ended up with a tax collection of like three hundred dollars. And uh, so as far as paving roads or, or building a jail or anything like that, it just didn't happen and there was nothing they could do about it. Um, you know, they didn't have a police force. They couldn't pay policemen. So they didn't have a police force to go out and arrest these people. So it was uh, wide open is a good description of the town at this point. Um, looks like we're actually about um, nearly out of time. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to share um, how people can buy your book again or contact you. And then we also had another question about if someone wanted a signed copy, if that's possible. Um, so if you have any in, of that information to wrap things up. Sure. Um, I, yeah, I'd love to give out signed copies. You can get the book on Amazon. 
Uh, it should be showing up in bookstores this month. Um, it was published on February 8th, but as I understand it from the publisher, it runs quarterly. So when they order copies for bookstores, uh, that they'll, you know, that the orders should be coming, should be made in March and it should be coming out soon. Uh, please, you know, if you don't see it anywhere, ask, ask whoever owns that store and why not? <laughs> I'd love to see it in as many places as possible. Uh, go ahead and email me. Let's see, what's the best way to get in touch about, um, what, if you don't mind, Marissa, could we do it through the History Center? Yeah. I'll, um, I'll bring a bunch of signed copies over to the History Center and, and you can pick them up there. I also sell, I have a good relationship with a neighbor um, for Kudzu Antiques. Um, I sell books there and I'm happy to drop off a bunch of signed copies. And uh, go ahead, if you wanna email me, I'll, I'll start collecting um, a list of people who want announcements about things. It's M-E Pfeiffer, Mark Edward Pfeiffer, P-I-F-E-R, at gmail.com. Uh, if you have any other questions, obviously I love to talk about this stuff. I spent a lot of time researching and I've only scratched the surface of the interesting stories that are around. It, Decatur was fun to write about, but Decatur had its, <laughs> had its stuff together more than Atlanta. Atlanta was all over the place. <laughs> so it was fun to learn about it. All right, well, I, I want to thank you so much um, for, for presenting today. We had a lot of, um, clearly this is a subject people, people really enjoy and have a lot of questions. Um, for anyone that joined late, we'll put this on our YouTube channel probably in a, a couple days or so. So you can see the full recording if you came in late. Um, but yes, uh, purchase it from your you know local book sh shop and we'll have them also um, at our at the museum. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.